Hey, hey, hey. Welcome back to Wine Time, everyone. And also, welcome to February. How are we in February of 2023? I will never know. I will never know. But that's not the point. The point is, today, we are starting with a podcast spotlight. And the podcast we are going to spotlight is the one, the only, Sips of Crime. This podcast is hosted by two awesome ladies, Michelle and Candy, and their dynamic is amazing. It's wonderful. And they're going to pop a bottle. They're going to talk true crime. And you guys are going to enjoy every single second of it. Here's our friends over at Sips of Crime Podcast. Take a listen and then go check them out. Hello to our freaky family. I'm Michelle. And I'm Candy. And this is Sips of Crime. better than true crime and good wine uh two friends talking about it you're so right we are two busy moms who have been friends for 20 years and love wine and true crime but rarely got to see each other so what better reason to start a podcast about the things we love each other wine and true crime so grab a glass grab a friend and let's dive in to some of the most notorious tales of murder mystery betrayal and a few laughs along the way (laughs) You can join our freaky family, both on Instagram and Facebook, at Sips of Crime. We do listeners' tales, so send in your true crime or paranormal stories to sipsofcrime at gmail.com. And you can find our podcast on whatever platform you get your podcasts. Until then, stay Stay alive. alive! All right, you guys, there you have it. And now for wine time. Welcome to Wine Wine Time. Time. I'm Rachel. And I'm Heather. Where two moms will pour a drink, espresso, wine, cocktail, who knows, and tell you stories or complain about moms. You will get the good, inspirational, uplifting, encouraging, the badass, we all know a badass mom, and the crime, moms who have committed them and or survived them. This is Wine Time, the good, the badass, and and the the crime. crime. Your quality looks amazing, by the way. Yes, it sure does. Does Oh, wait, is that your face? Your face this looks amazing. That's what looks face. amazing. <laughs> hey, girl. Hey, what's up? I'm loving your beanie look right now. With my man's it's jacket. Very, and your flannel. Jacket. You look very <laughs> gangster. I, that's the exact thing I wanted to represent today was just that G life. And so here we are. Um, no, it's it. it's freezing. It is yeah. cold AF. Um, I have never and I mean that you know how sometimes people like exaggerate and stuff I have never seen the size snow snowflakes whatever that I saw today they were cotton balls they were this big I was like that's not snow you guys like what is this (laughs) thing falling from the sky and I'm just not I'm not cut out for this and everyone's kind of laughing at me and someone was like you're gonna be fine You'll drive you're safe, like, no, and, and I'm a when California you're driving, girl, like, well, this is that's not, not cool. even no, that's not even it. <laughs> They're like, drive safe and drive slow, and just don't hit your brakes. I said, I'm not worried about me. I'm not worried about me. I'm worried about all the other people around me out there because they're the ones who suck. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was like, I'm true. fine. I can drive. Yeah. I'm not worried about myself. I mean, you used to drive around for like a living, like that's what you did. So yeah. So is that what your wine time is is that what i'm whining about today i I guess that's exactly what it would be is bad drivers and uh big ass snowballs coming down in the from the sky when i drove to work it was snow you know just snow and i was like oh gosh i hate the snow and then when i was like in my classroom i'm looking out and i'm just like you've got to be shitting me right now like what is this you're like what is this 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 thick white stuff. (laughs) Not about it. (laughs) I honestly cannot remember the last time I was like outside in 
snow. It had to have been like three years ago. I swear. It's been a long, long time. People are like, you snowboard. What are you talking about? You don't like snow. I said, I hate snow. I love snow. Yeah. That's fun because, I mean, I suck at it. I, sh- I shouldn't say I love it. I'm pretty awful. <laughs> <laughs> but here we are, which is really hard for me to admit because I tend to think I'm good at everything I've ever done in life. And snowboarding, no, it did not, but it did heard, not come to me. I have heard that the learning curve for snowboarding is, like, very – steep like it takes you a long 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 time to like finally like get in the groove but then once you hit it you're supposed to like all of a sudden you're like you go from really really shitty to like boom but it just takes a long time is that not I'll let you know when I hit that curve (laughs) right now I'm not there yet (laughs) I'll let you know though (laughs) are there mountains in Kentucky for you to snowboard there Yes, I'm sure that like, there are. I know nothing about Kentuckian geography. <laughs> um, I'm not sure where the closest place to go is. I think when I moved here, I Googled it. It was like an hour and a half away. Um, okay. So, I mean, okay. not too bad. But I- I'm just, you know, I'm busy. I'm busy with life. But what do you What do you have to whine about today, girlfriend? Girlfriend? I, honestly, I will tell you. So, I'm going to tell you about my wine, and then I'm going to tell you what I'm drinking at the same time, because they go hand in hand. I am so sick of being sick. Mm. I kid you not, like, I have not had one week without some kind of symptom, I swear, for the last three months. These girls, and, I mean, because I work from home, so, like, I go to the grocery store, I go pick up my children... There's not much more than that. I mean, yeah, like, we see family and stuff, but I swear, I'm just, I have just been sick, 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 and this week, it's a lot better now, but, like, Mm -hmm. a few days ago, my throat was killing me, killing me, so I'm drinking tea yet again to soothe my sore throat because, like, I'm so tired of it. I'm so tired of it. I really hope. That we are, like, past the hump. And Tempe just got over, like, an ear infection. Evie had, like, a throat thing and a runny nose. And I'm just, like, I'm so done. So done with it. It's a curve. You're just waiting to hit that curve. (laughs) When you hit there. (laughs) When you get there, everything's going to be fine. I'll let you know when I get there. (laughs) All right. Sounds good. (laughs) We might hit it on the same day. (laughs) Oh, God. You know, uh, you will have your snowboarding curve, and we'll curve yeah. it together. Let's curve it together. And we'll both be curvy women. Curvy. We'll hey, we curvy curve now. all the right way. We love that curve. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that curve. So you're drinking that. Um, I am drinking. What is that? Oh, look, a Longhorn. Texas Longhorns. Oh. Um, this is a ranch water. Is that the ranch water? Yeah. Lone River, Texas. Um, it is the spicy hard seltzer. Um, it's the only thing I have in my house. So I just grabbed it. It was this or water. Uh, yeah, so we're going to pop this. Pop it. Are y'all ready pop for it, it? I can't do it oh, with yeah. my nails. Let's Here we go. Oh, beautiful. With a mixture beautiful. of me hitting the microphone because. I know. Tremors. <laughs> <laughs> because there we are. <laughs> Um, all is well, all is well. If you guys want to see me do that, hashtag Patreon. Uh, cheers, boo. Cheers. Nice cheers. cup. I cheers. dig it. Uh, uh. I love it. I love it. I am excited. Y'all, it's Heather's turn to tell me a story. I am so and excited. I wanna hear it so bad. Because you don't know a whole heck of a lot about this case. Yeah, I've definitely heard. I heard have mentioned. It, it, ish, it, ish. Yes, ish. I have mentioned this case previously on the, like, crime documentary one uh, episode. Um, But we are going to get into all the detail today. So, are you ready? I'm I'm always ready. But, before you begin. Okay. Listeners, are you guys ready? What? (laughs) <laughs> Heather's like, what are you going to tell me? She's so excited. What are you going to say? I don't know what you're going to say. I want our listeners to be ready. If you guys are not ready, go get your drink. Go do whatever okay. you're going to do. Get ready it for is. it. Because it's going to be Pause it. a good one. Go get yourself some ranch water. Ranch water. Go get water. yourself some tea. 
tea. Go get yourself regular water. Regular water. Whatever your drink of choice. Anything. Sit back. Sit back. And relax. Or if you're driving, sit forward. Hands on 10 and 2. Or what do they tell you now? 3 and 6? Or 3 and 9? 3 and 6. That wouldn't make sense. (laughs) Whatever you're doing. (laughs) (laughs) Who holds a steering wheel? Drive like with your... Not I. (laughs) People have their seat all the way back. They're just like... They don't even see the street. (laughs) They got their middle finger on them. (laughs) That's how I drive. One pinky. Hey, pinky's up. All right, I'm ready though. <laughs> Listeners are ready. Okay. And you, Lee we're Stowe. ready. Lee Stowe, boo boo. Lee Stowe. So, this is the case of Kathleen Peterson, also known as the staircase. Mm-hmm. Okay? Mm-hmm. All right. So, we're going to dive in. We're going to dive in. Um, December 9th, 2001. 48-year-old Kathleen Peterson was found dead at the bottom of the staircase in her home in Durham, North Carolina. So, a little bit of background. Kathleen was like a corporate businesswoman, like balling, big time. She had gone to, I think it was like Duke. She was like, smart, smart, smart lady. She lived with her husband, Michael Peterson, who was an author Um, He had written, like, a couple of books that I guess did decent. Like, one of them ended up, I think, on the the New York Times bestseller list. They'd been married for, I think, like, four years, but they'd been together a lot longer. Like, they'd been together, like, 10, 12, 13 years, okay? So, Kathleen and Michael had a very blended family. Um, All of their children were actually adults at the time that Kathleen died. Um, But, so, there's Clayton and Todd who are Michael's um, biological sons from a previous marriage. There's Margaret and Martha Ratliff, who are actually adopted daughters um, by Michael. They were actually adopted by Michael and his first wife. Um, and they were adopted from, these, from family friends who had passed away while um, Michael Peterson and his family and then that family, the Ratliff family, were living in Germany. So he's had them, though. He adopted them when they were very, very little. Lastly, we have Caitlin Atwater, who is Kathleen's biological daughter. So like I said, they're all adults. I think like 18 to like mid-20s. They're all adults, but it's a very blended family for, you know, everything we're told that they still spent a lot of time together. I mean, they're adult children, so they're kind of, like, living their their lives, starting college, that kind of thing. But they were very close. They, at one point, they were all living in the same house, right? Um, All close. So that's just a little bit of background on the family. So back to December 9th, 2001. So a witness actually reported that he had spoken to both Kathleen and Michael that night on the phone around 6 p.m. And he said they were acting completely ordinary, nothing out of the norm. And then according to Michael, this is his story, um, Kathleen and him spent the night watching a movie, eating dinner, drinking wine. They went to their backyard um, by like their pool and were just chilling talking, drinking wine by the pool. Michael says that Kathleen then goes inside and goes on the computer and Michael stays outside um, and finishes smoking his pipe, which is like weird. Okay. Right. I I don't know. Pipes are just weird. I'm like, who are you, Gandalf? Shut up. (laughs) Shut up. (laughs) Who are you? My grandpa was Gandalf. (laughs) Yeah, like, I mean, oh. well, and it's like, okay, like, back in the day, I'm like, okay, I get it. And I mean, yeah, this guy's older, but I'm well, like. 2001's not, you said 2001, right? That's not. Yeah, and I think he was, like, in his 50s, maybe. So I'm like, but I don't know. It's just weird. Anyway, so <laughs> Kathleen goes inside, goes on her computer. Michael stays outside <laughs> by the pool. <laughs> You're smoking a pipe? Who do you think you are, Gandalf? <laughs> Does Gandalf Um, even smoke a pipe? (laughs) I think so, didn't he? Like the long one? And then he. No, no, he did. Oh, that's what you're talking about. I'm I'm thinking of the tiny little. You're like. (laughs) Yeah, okay. I apologize. (laughs) 
Oh, man. Oh, fuck. Okay. Papa Gandalf. Um. <laughs> oh, we're back. Sorry, guys. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. All, All right. You so now smokers. when I go Sorry. through this story, I'm no longer going to call him Michael Peterson. Papa I'm going to call him Gandalf <laughs> Peterson. Papa Gandalf. And you guys just need to keep up with yeah. it. Okay. Papa Gandalf Peterson. <laughs> Papa Gandalf Peterson. So, um, yeah, sometime after that, Papa Gandalf Peterson, he... No, I'm just kidding. I want to do that. I want to do that. Okay. okay um, <laughs> We're serious. So, okay. So, the, the, she goes inside, goes on the computer, Michael stays outside. So, sometime after this, <clears throat> Michael places two 911 calls. And this is at, like, 2 in the morning. He places two 911 calls. Um, he says that his wife has had an accident that she has fallen down the stairs. And on the first call, he says that she's still breathing. <clears throat> and then he hangs up. The call gets disconnected. He hangs up. Yeah. And he calls back again asking, like, where are you? Where's the ambulance? You know, why isn't somebody here yet, basically? And on the second call, he says she's not breathing anymore. Okay. So this 911 call, if you watch... The Forensic Files episode about this. If you watch the actual, like, documentary, the Netflix, if you, on Netflix, if you watch, like, anything or you hear this call, I don't know what to make of it. Hmm. Because he sounds, <clears throat> he sounds upset, but parts of it sound so fake and, and, like, just very fake. But then other parts of it sound really genuine yeah. And it's hard it's hard to judge because if you listen to this dude talk, like even for a short amount of time if you listen to this dude talk, he is a dramatic dude. He's an author. Right. So like he like puts a lot of drama into his speech and I just so it's hard to kind of I don't know. This 911 call, if you guys want to listen to it, you can easily find it. <clears throat> And I just like it's it's hard to say, but anyway, he makes he ends up making two nine one one calls, um, you know, indicating his wife falling down the stairs. <clears throat> I mean, and then shortly we talk about nine one one calls a lot though because you you yeah. seriously can never know what you're you going to say, how you're going to you act. Don't whatever. know how you're going to react. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You could be the most calm, collective person, and you can lose <clears throat> your shit, and you could be someone who's like crazy and just be like stoic. You know, so yeah, who knows what it's going to exactly. be. Exactly. It's very hard to say. It's very hard to say. So um, shortly after these 911 calls, Michael's son, Todd, actually arrives on the scene um, before the emergency services get there, though. And um, he sees, you know, Kathleen's body and everything. And supposedly what it was is that Michael called his son, Todd, after placing the 911 call. Todd gets there very fast. And then, like, within minutes, like, it was not, <clears throat> it didn't take, like, an hour or anything for emergency, the emergency services to arrive. They show up on scene. Um, and at some point, too, as well, Margaret and Martha, Michael's adopted daughters, um, when they come over to the house, one of the first things they actually say, one of the first things they remember their dad telling them was, I didn't do it. You have to believe me. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so the initial medical examiner on the scene also said it was a fall. She fell down the steps. But one of the arriving officers, like actual like cops, he saw the scene and he said that the amount of blood around the body was not consistent with someone who had just fallen down the stairs. Yeah. Okay. And also, they noticed that the blood around her was really dried. So it wasn't, to them, it didn't feel like it was a re more recent event. Because like I said, the, the ambulance showed up really, really fast. So the blood had dried around her. Right. Um, they said so much so that the medical examiners didn't even really have to, like, suit up because, like, the blood was dry. That's crazy. So, yeah. Um, so basically, Kathleen had seven lacerations on her head like on the back of her skull she had some other cuts and bruises on her body and there was also blood on the bottom of her feet and not just like 
smears or anything. Like, from if you see the picture, it looks like she actually, like, stepped in a pool of blood. Um, and then there was some blood also found outside of the, like, initial staircase area, like, around the house. Including some outside of the house. Yeah. Um, and they found a bloody shoe print <clears throat> that was consistent with the sneakers that Michael Peterson was wearing actually imprinted on the sweats that Kathleen was wearing. So, like, yeah, he like stepped, he stepped on, on her. her. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He stepped on her, like, on her leg. Um, okay. He just, like, so, walks down the stairs and he's like, hey, you wake? Like, what's up? Stepping on her? That's yeah. not the way to do okay. it. <laughs> Gandalf. <laughs> <laughs> Gandalf. You stop people, Gandalf. <laughs> um, okay. So even though the medical examiner who was on the scene said that they thought that she fell down the stairs, yeah. they conducted an autopsy and they concluded that Kathleen died by homicide due to blunt force trauma. Um, <clears throat> so... You know, they said one thing at the scene. The cop was like, I don't know about this. They do an autopsy. Medical examiner says, no. Like, she she has blunt force trauma to her head where where all of the lacerations were. And it didn't take long, obviously, after that for Michael to be charged with Kathleen's murder. And so he's charged, but he's really quickly let out on bail. Like, he doesn't spend a lot of time in jail. And this starts the beginning of one of the craziest investigation, trial, retrial, with so much, quote-unquote, like, forensic evidence and experts and and differing expert opinions and controversial, like, you know, evidence and, thing, like, so many things happened in this case. Um, I swear, it was like the, it was like, to me, it reminded me of OJ because it was super publicized, like, all throughout the state, And there's just so much back and forth. So many people saying, no, no, this, no, no, that. And it was, it was crazy. And I feel like it was similar because it was like, they're getting so caught up in this case. And did he do it? Did he not do it? This evidence says yes. This evidence doesn't, you know, bickering back and forth that at the end of the day, like this case, it totally lost sight of the fact that a wife and a mother of five people is dead right and she's not there right so <clears throat> another kind of thing like along this lines that definitely pushed the publicity of this case is it got super super famous because of this documentary called the staircase so basically shortly after he was um like arrested and 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 was going to be put on trial this french film crew starts documenting the entire case and Michael, the husband, is the main, like, character. So when you watch this documentary, it's very much centered around him. Yeah. And the people that are on his side of the case, like, the defense th- side and stuff. And they do get some interviews with, like, outside sources. But in the way, and in my opinion, the way it's edited, it's making you feel sorry for him. It's making you look like he's the victim. And I swear, it's like they barely they barely touch on the fact that, like, Kathleen Peterson is dead and she's no longer there. And and when they're talking about it, it's always, like, him talking about, well, she was the love of my life and da 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 And, like, they, they're just so focused on him. And you can, like, it's very, to me, it's very skewed in one, one way. Um, so, I mean, make what you will of that. But it, to me, it just feels really one-sided. See, now I want to go, I want to go watch it and see if that's a you thing. Like, if you're taking it that yeah, way. Or you should. if it is actually that way. Because, I mean, what I, totally say, should. what I say goes. So, you have your opinion and I'm you know, the final. Yeah, 100%. I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm the deciding factor <laughs> no, here. No, but, like, all the listeners should, too. So, it's on Netflix. Yeah. You can watch the entire thing on Netflix. Right. It's, like, ten episodes um, like Never mind. some of them, like spoiler Too alert, I think I already said it, but like half of it, more than half of it, like seven or eight of it is the actual trial trial. And then they get into the retrial because he does get retried. Right. Um, so like go watch it. It's very interesting. And, and tell us what you think. Like, do you think, like, what do you think of the evidence? Because it gets, it gets crazy. It gets crazy. Um, but yeah, so like I said, 
there are the five children in this blended family, yeah. right? And um, so Michael's two sons, Todd and Clayton, they stand by him the whole entire time, support their dad, say that, um, you know, believe it was an accident. Um, and the same thing for Margaret and Martha, his adopted daughters, who, you know, they've been with him since they were little, little, little. I don't even think they really remember their biological parents. They also stand by him, believe it was an accident. <clears throat> and then there's Caitlin, Kathleen's biological daughter. And at first, she is also on her stepdad's side, yeah. believes that it was, you know, a tragic accident, believes him when he says, I didn't, you know, this was an accident, don't listen to what they're trying to accuse me of. But yeah. then, as the evidence starts rolling out, especially, like, the autopsy pictures where she sees, like, her mom's head, she changes her mind. So, Caitlin changes her mind and says, no, like, this was not an accident. And then Kathleen Peterson also has two sisters who were kind of the same as Caitlin. Like, at first they were like, oh, this is such an accident. We don't think Michael could ever do this. They had such a great marriage. You know, they were very happy together. We know Michael didn't do this. And then same thing, like, as evidence starts to come out, both of Kathleen's sisters are like, no. Like, they believe that, you know, Caitlin and his two sisters believe that Michael murdered Kathleen. Mm -hmm. And they start actually working with the prosecution. Okay. So it's like really sad, like family split. But, yeah. Um, so the trial. So this is like things get like this trial is insane. This trial goes on for like three or four months. Yeah. It's long. So the prosecution maintains that Kathleen was hit on the head with a blunt force object. And they actually say that Kathleen was hit on the head with like, a blow poke, like one of the things you use in the fireplace to like stoke a fire. Um, but they didn't have the actual what? A blow poke? Yeah, so I've never so before this, I did not know. So do you know what this thing is? It's so weird. People have invented some crazy stuff. I was gonna say, well, people have different words for it because no. I call it a pick hole. <laughs> But it's because there's this really a pick hole? there's a really funny story along with it, and I'm trying to think if I've told this on the podcast. But uh, you have not. We, I've not heard this story. <laughs> like I've never heard the word pick hole. No, please tell me. <laughs> okay, pause on the crime. Sorry, everybody. Long story short, and maybe I need to get into this more in depth on one of uh, this should be one of our like Patreon paranormal, not paranormal, but creepy episodes but one time I was at my house which there was like some things that would happen your Kentucky house no my my your old house yeah in California yes okay so and I was young and my younger brother was there my cousin Heather was there and my cousin Chris was there I don't know if anyone else was there but weird stuff happened and all four of us constantly think that someone else was playing a prank i 100 percent never did a thing people think it was me my brother 100 percent never did a thing people think it was him no one knows who the heck did things but to the Stop. my front door being open certain things being moved doors shutting i mean doors shut when no. all four of us were together so it was it was very weird the whole point no. is my cousin heather comes running out of our living room and she goes i've got the pick hole and I was like, the what? <laughs> I, was, I was like, the oh no, what? God. What did you just call it? A blow? No, like you've a blow never pick? told me that story. A blow something? A blow poke. A blow poke. So, like, it's the thing you poke into a fireplace and you can blow on the end of it to, like, make fire. <laughs> to make fire. <laughs> to, like, get the fire going, you know? Because, yeah. like, you can blow yeah. on a fire yeah. to get it going. Yeah. So they called it a blow poke. Not a pick hole, that is, but I actually like pick hole better. It's a pick in a hole. <laughs> yeah, that, well, that's exactly what it is. It's a pick in a hole. Yeah, so that's this, also. I'm trying to think how old I don't we like were. that. I need to ask Weston. I'm really bad at stuff, but I remember, and I am the person, <laughs> as everyone here can tell, I'm the person that can't take shit serious whatsoever. And I remember my mom specifically, we're all like sitting at the table and she is like asking questions and 
like being serious yeah. and telling us yeah. we need to be serious about stuff. And I'm hysterically laughing. I think that's why people kept thinking I did something. I didn't do shit, but I'm uncomfortable, so yeah. I'm going to laugh about it. And yeah. she would be like, you better not laugh, and you're going to go to <laughs> And I'm just like. <laughs> Which is only going to make you laugh more. <laughs> but it was not. It was not me. So That reminds me of, like, The Strangers. Like, that's creepy. It was definitely weird. I mean, there was times that during, like, basketball games, I would be home, and I would hear something upstairs. One time I left my house. I went to a neighbor's house down the street, and I was like, I can't go back there. And, like, my Uh -uh. mom or dad was like, it must have been a mouse or a squirrel or something. And I'm just like, must have been I was gone. Must have been I'm not dying in this house. I'm not that person walking up the stairs. I'm that person running out the door. I don't nope. play those See games. Peace. So, anyways, <laughs> that's why I'm alive still, guys. I don't be running up the stairs. I run out the door. <laughs> I'm not investigating shit. <laughs> As you shouldn't do oh, that too. Man. The investigators. Anyways, okay. okay, I'm sorry. Back to Gandalf Peterson. Go. Um. So they said that Papa Gandalf hit Kathleen in the head with a pick hole. Yes. And <laughs> <laughs> sorry, we did not joke about this. Okay. Right. So <laughs> they said, um, okay, so yes, they said that the murder weapon was a blow poke, but they couldn't find it. They searched the house, but couldn't find it. And the reason they thought it was the blow poke is um, they had found out that this blow poke had been like in her family, like always been in her house, had been part of like her help for a long time because one of Kathleen's six sisters actually gifted her this blow poke. Apparently Kathleen's sister got a blow poke one one time and was like, this is awesome and decided to give give blow poke. I need you to stop saying blow poke. Stop <laughs> sorry. Stop saying blow poke. <laughs> she decided to give pick holes to <laughs> Hey. Hey. So she gave she gave them as gifts to a bunch of her family members. So she's the one. I think she is the reason why the prosecution like went down this theory. Is she said I gave her one of these. It's missing from the house. And supposedly the prosecution's investigators they search the whole house. They search the property. They can't find it anywhere. So they say like this was the murder weapon. This is, you know, this is how she was, she was killed. Um, we can't find it, but they have one that Kathleen's sister had. So they have basically like a replica of mm, it. Yeah. Okay. That they're like presenting in court as the murder weapon. <clears throat> and then the, bro- the prosecution also has like a blood splatter expert saying that all of the blood in the staircase is consistent with a beating with an object. Ugh. And then... The prosecution also goes after, like, Michael Peterson's character. So, besides, like, physical evidence, they also said he's a liar. Basically, they said he lied about how he was wounded during Vietnam because he was, he was, he served in Vietnam. And he kind of, basically, I think the thing is, like, he let, he was running for mayor or some kind of office of the town. And he, he let on that he was, like, wounded in Vietnam and he was, like, a war hero, but really he was, like, in a car accident or something like that. So they said, you know, he's a liar. He has this this history of lying. And they also said that he was lying to Kathleen and to the majority of his family, if not all of his family, about his sexuality. So. Oh, this, I didn't Basically, know they, yeah. So, basically, they find evidence that he is, bisexual and on top of that that he was having affairs with men outside of their marriage so like he was cheating on kathleen with other men um so they find all this evidence on his computer basically and they find emails and they find um like from like male sex workers they find a bunch of like porn they find a bunch of stuff showing this and so what the prosecution thinks happened is they say like how they lay it out is that Kathleen found the evidence of his affairs that she confronts him they fight and then Michael hits her right 
The other thing that they point to is the fact that Michael was the beneficiary of Kathleen's life insurance policy, which was worth a decent amount of money because she made pretty good money in her, you know, like fancy corporate job. <clears throat> so the defense, um, they spend tons of money on private investigators and experts and witness coaches and special like jury selection people and all this stuff. And at one point, they even said they were spending like seven hundred and fifty to eight hundred thousand um, dollars, and that's back in the early two thousands. Yeah. And that's on top of his like bond, which was like eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars or something like that. So um, the defense they say that the lacerations on the skull on Kathleen's skull was from her hitting her head mm. in the staircase. So. They had a lot of experts. Like I said, this case is just like full of like, quote unquote, like forensic experts. And they look at the autopsy photographs. They look at the blood spatter um, in the staircase. And this is the part that like kind of creeps me out. And like on one hand, I understand like they're trying to preserve evidence, you know, which is a good thing. But then on the other hand, so like the staircase that this happened in, they keep all of the blood on the walls in this staircase, like weeks months after her death so that different experts can come in and look at it. Yeah. And at one point, the whole jury during the trial Season. straight up field trips it to the house to look at the staircase. Jeez. And it's like, on one hand, I understand, like, you want to preserve evidence so that you can, like, prove things. But then on the other hand, I'm like, that's creepy. Like, he lives in this house. Because remember, he's out on bail. Yeah. He lives in this house, and every day he walks by this, like... What the hell? So anyway, anyway. that is wild. Uh, I would isn't not that, be staying like, there. Really weird. That's crazy. Like I know it's so weird, and like it's the where the staircase was was like right off the kitchen. So like it's not like it was in like the back part of the house where yeah. like you didn't have to walk by it. Like seemingly this dude walked by it every day. But let anyway, me make some anyway. tomato soup so, while I look at the blood spill at her. I know my it's so staircase. gross. Like it's so weird. And like, if you watch this documentary. You know, he's home during this four-month, three, four-month trial, just, like, living his life at home. And it's just, I don't, it's just crazy. It's crazy. Um, so the defense, they say that the, um, that they looked at all of the beating cases in North Carolina, which was, like, for, like, the past 10 years. It was, like, 200 and something cases. And they said that every single time there was a beating case where someone was hit in the head with a blunt force or blunt object... Um, that there were skull fractures and or massive brain injuries. And they said Kathleen Peterson didn't have any of that, which is why they are trying to prove like this was a fall, because if it had been a blunt force object, you would have seen like more damage yeah. and they didn't. <clears throat> also, also, also after the prosecution <clears throat> in trial. So in trial, right, the prosecution presents their case. They say we rest and then the defense presents right. their case. So after the prosecution had rested their case, and while the defense was in the middle of presenting their case, one of Michael's sons, you ready, finds the missing blowpoke. What? Magically, this missing alleged murder weapon appears in their house. In their house. So it's like right near the end of this trial, right? Like it's it's only a few days before the defense is going to wrap up their case and this the murder weapon appears. So the defense team and Michael and one of his sons, which I find just like so and so like I understand like under the law, the defense doesn't have to share evidence with the prosecution side. Like I get that. Like the prosecution side is the one that has to share everything to the defense. Like I understand that. But I just was like, this can't be legal. Like, it has to be considered tampering with evidence, right? Because they knew that they wanted to use this blowpoke as the murder weapon. But right. they find it in their house. And Michael's defense attorney and one of, like, the PIs who's been working on the case since the beginning and Michael and one of Michael's sons collects, it, like, photographs it where it was found, collects it, puts it in this, like, pl plastic cylinder, and then they keep it in their possession. Where was it found? And then they test in his house, in his basement. Isn't that crazy? Like, it was in his house. 
So you have to really wonder, like, yeah, it's supposedly weird the because they said that they looked for it. So it's exactly like, the the prosecution's investigator said they looked for they looked for it and they couldn't find it. So how does it magically appear now? They didn't look very Don't hard. Know. Apparently, they didn't look very hard, or it was planted there, or, like, who knows. So, the the defense tries to say, and the defense, they test it for blood, they test it for DNA, it's clean. And so, they don't find any blood or anything like that. When they present, the defense then, like, brings it to court and says, like, look, here it is. You guys said this was the murder weapon. You guys said it was missing. Here it is. And so your whole theory that it was this and that and they got rid of it is out, right? And then the prosecution, they try a couple different things. They try to say, um, well, maybe that's not the actual missing one. And they sit there and they compare it to like the three or four other other ones that mm-hmm. Kathleen's sister had like gifted to different family members. And then during closing, the prosecution even, like, backpedals and says, look, they find this missing blowpoke, but we never said, like, specifically it was the blowpoke. We said it was something similar or like, like it was a weapon like it. And they're, like, backpedaling. And it's just, like, yeah, this trial is just full of stuff like like that. So, yeah, exactly. So the defense, they say that, um, you know, Kathleen had a, basically... What their theory is, is that Kathleen had a blood alcohol level of 0.07, and she also had some Valium in her system, and they said it was an ill-lit staircase, and she was wearing flip-flops, and that what happened is as she tries to walk up the stairs, she falls backwards, she hits her head on, you know, the side of the staircase, that she tries to, like, lift herself up, but she slips in the blood, which is how they explain, like, the blood on the bottom of her feet, She slips in the pool of her own blood after having hit her head. Um, And then um, they said, you know, that basically after that, because of blood loss, she she died. Um, And they have their own blood spatter um, expert who, like, if you watch, like, crime shows, like, like Forensic Files or whatever, you've seen this dude um, in these crime shows. But he says that there's no evidence of you know, like a blunt force attack with a weapon because there's no cast off blood stuff. And he says that all the other blood uh, in the staircase, and it's like, if you guys see pictures of this, like it's a lot of blood in this like small staircase. Um, He said that the rest of this blood can all be explained by her falling, kind of passing out, waking up, slipping again, and even like coughing up blood because she was injured or whatever. Like all of that can be explained. So, um, the defense, they even go, like, they even conduct an experiment, and it's so creepy if you watch them do it. They put, like, a speaker, basically, in the staircase, and then they go, and they all go outside to the backyard, where Michael Peterson was allegedly hanging out at, and they have the speaker playing, like, a woman going, help, help, help me, and they're trying to see if you can hear it from the backyard. Yeah. Yeah, because what they're trying, because like, you know, the prosecution can argue like if she fell, why did it take him so long to get there, you know, and what did he not hear her or whatever. So they even do that and it's kind of like creepy. Um, And then so the defense says they try to argue that as far as like all of the hidden bisexuality and the extramarital affairs. They, that first, they're trying to keep out any of the sexuality stuff. Like, they think that it will cause, you know, a bias to the jury. You have to remember, like, this is early 2000s. So, yeah, like, people are still, you know, com- like, homophobic and stuff. And um, they're, they're also trying to keep out some of the stuff about his extramarital affairs, saying that it's not relevant to the case and that it will have an undue bias, like, on the jury. So they, they should keep it out. But the prosecution, they say, like, no, we have to leave it in because that's the whole motive. Right. Right? That's the whole part. Yeah, you have to find what the person is doing something for, whether or not it it was. I mean, it doesn't have to be. But if you are trying to fight something, you are finding why would this person do it? This is why they would do it. Exactly. So the prosecution is like, no, you have to leave it in. You know, this is our motive. Like, this is why... Kathleen Peterson was killed 
And and then the defense or the the prosecution's also like, look, this also goes to say, like, everyone was sitting there thinking this was a happy marriage, this was a good marriage, everyone's saying it was like the best thing ever. This guy's having affairs and his wife doesn't know that he's bisexual so it's clearly not the happy marriage everyone right. is you know making out to be That's a good point. um so yeah so like i said like the prosecution they had already found like all this evidence on the computer like the emails and the porn and everything like that but what they also do is they call a witness in the trial who is a self-defined male escort basically he is on a website that you can go to um, and hire a male sex worker. And so this witness comes in, testifies. Basically, this guy says that in his communications with Michael, like I think there was emails and even some like phone calls, Michael tells him, Michael tells this guy, I'm a very happily married man. And, um, and this the sex worker, he says that a lot of his clients are married and it wasn't uncommon for his clients to have wives who knew about their sexual preferences. Um, so it was just, it, it's crazy. And, and they, I think the prosecution thought like, oh, this is a, this is a smoking gun. Like we found the sex worker, the sex worker is going to tell us like all of this nitty gritty. Yeah, like give dirt. And yeah, it worked dirt, and him. basically, it kind of did because the sex worker's like, "No, Michael told me that his wife, he loves his wife, and um, I don't think like they said like I don't think he ever said like I love my wife. She knows all about this or whatever, but he didn't get the idea that it was a complete secret or whatever. Right. So they say the the defense maintains they say like Kathleen knew all about it. She knew about his sexual preferences and the affairs. And she was okay with it. Some people do that. Some people, some people do that. that. Yeah, I'm like, some people, like, they need something else and they have this arrangement exactly. of some sort. And, and you know, if they're, and live if your both life. people are happy with it, right. both people are happy with it. So that's what they claim during the trial. Right. But later on, after all is said and done, they're like, no. Michael admits that it was, it was kind of, I think what he basically says is it was like kind of like known to Kathleen but he he admits like he didn't outwardly say Kathleen I'm bisexual and I like to have sex with men outside of our marriage right. like he so he kind of ends up saying and this is like after the trial like that she she had an idea but she didn't know everything I think basically is what he was trying to say so um but the defense team during the trial was like no Kathleen knew and blah 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 so yeah so all of the craziness of the trial and that's not even the biggest twist. Oh, shit. So, Kathleen Peterson is actually not the first woman in Michael Peterson's life to be found with head wounds at the bottom of some stairs. Yeah. I forgot all about this part! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, where are you going to tell me? Wait, I'm pretty sure I included this before. You did, you did. But when you said Kathleen Peterson, instantly I was going to be like, is still alive. (laughs) She's somewhere. But I totally (laughs) forgot about this part. Okay, keep going. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so like 20 years earlier, like I said, Peterson and his first wife, they were living in Germany. They had their two young sons. And they were really close friends with a family, the Ratliff family. And so the Ratliffs, there was a husband, there was a wife, there were two um, daughters, two young, young daughters. Yeah, that's his, and the, the husband ones he actually, adopted. Exactly. So the husband actually passes away. So Elizabeth Ratliff is a widow, family friends with the Petersons. She has two young, young daughters. I'm talking like baby toddlers, okay? They're having dinner together, the Petersons and the Ratliffs. And after dinner, Michael helps put the babies to sleep. He supposedly goes back to his house. The next day, the Ratliff's nanny finds Elizabeth Ratliff in her apartment at the bottom of her stairs, and she's dead. No. During the initial investigation in Germany, they say that Michael Peterson was the last person to see her alive. Um, but they say it was an aneurysm that she basically like had an aneurysm, a hemorrhage in her brain, 
she died and then she fell down the stairs. Um, but yeah, these are the two. And so her two young daughters are then adopted by Michael and his then wife. And then when Michael and his first wife, when they divorce, the girls actually stay with Michael. Okay. So, um, both sides, prosecution and defense, they investigate this, obviously. The defense team actually goes to Germany to see, like, where it happened, to, to get testimony from people, all of this stuff. And like I said, it was originally ruled like an accident. Um, but the prosecution, they're so dead set on this, they exhume this woman's body after, like, 20 years. Dang. They actually have to get, I know, it's really sad, too, because they have to get the two daughters, they have to get their permission yeah. And you said after daughters, 20 years, like, so that's like yesterday. Yeah. Two years ago. I mean, yeah, years yeah. Ago. This happened, well, so this happened like 20 years before the trial. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So that happened back in like 1980 something. Okay. okay. Um, so the two daughters, they have to sign off on their mom being exhumed their birth mother being right. exhumed gotcha. and they think like whatever just do it because it'll prove that our dad is innocent but <laughs> when they exhume her body um the person who does the medical exam on the exhumed body they said that her injuries elizabeth ratliff's injuries were quote the result of a homicidal homicidal attack mm-hmm. and that there were Mm-hmm. And there were lacerations on the back of Elizabeth Ratliff's head, very similar to the ones on Kathleen Peterson's head. Yeah. Damn. So, it's so weird. And I mean, like, so, well, okay, so a couple things about this. One, the person who did the autopsy on Elizabeth Ratliff after being exhumed was the same person who did the autopsy on Kathleen. So I feel mm. like... If they had wanted to be completely unbiased, they should have got someone else yeah. to do it. Yeah, for sure. Conflict of interest, like, for sure. Um, and then there was all this publicity about it because they did this exhumation just, like, a few weeks before the trial was going to start. So, and there was, all, like I said, this case was already famous. So, to add this on top of it. And so, right. it's, like, to find a jury member who wouldn't have been biased and, like, known about all that stuff or whatever, like, that would have been impossible. Um, but... At the same time, like, that's, like, one hell of a coincidence, right? Like, how how does that happen twice in your life? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like, how does that happen twice in your life? Um, So they fight in court about this. Like, the defense obviously says, like, they shouldn't even be allowed to bring this Elizabeth Ratliff stuff up. And it shouldn't be allowed in trial. But ultimately, the judge says it's allowed in. Right. um, Because, and the prosecution wants to, you know, like make it part of their case. So they point to all the similarities. Like they, like I said, like he was the last person to see both of them alive. Um, they were both found at the bottom of the stairs with lacerations on their head. Um, so they don't go so far as to say like Michael Peterson murdered Elizabeth Ratliff, but like they really heavily imply it. Right. And yeah. So it's Cause they're not like charging him with it, but they're using it in their case. So, yeah. So, um, they, so the prosecution, they have, the, all the blood spatter evidence on the staircase. They have the motive of the extramarital affairs and getting, like, found out. And then also, like, the life insurance could have been a motive. They have the death of Elizabeth Ratliff, like, 20 years earlier. Um, so after, like I said, this this trial went on, like, three or four months. And then it took four days for the jury to deliberate. Michael Peterson is convicted okay. of first-degree murder of Kathleen Peterson. And this ha- is in October of 2003. So almost two years after Mm -hmm. Kathleen um, died. And he was sentenced to life without parole. Yeah. So he goes to jail. But that's not the end of the story. (laughs) Yeah, didn't you say something recent happened or something? So so basically, yeah, more recent, he goes to jail. They try to appeal it like they normally would. For a couple years, they get denied. Yeah. Then, in 2011... So, like, like 10 years after the murder, like, 7, 8 years after the trial, in 2011, a witness for the prosecution um, was investigated for allegedly mishandling a bunch of cases 
a bunch of cases that he worked on, including the Kathleen Peterson case. Okay. So basically, this guy, he was the blood spatter expert who they relied on heavily, right? Because they didn't, I mean, the blood spatter was one of their actual physical evidences, right? Like, that was all they really had in terms of physical evidence. This guy, what he would do was he would try, he would basically, like, skew his experiments when he was doing, like, blood spatter experiments. He would skew his experiments to fit the prosecution's theory. So he wasn't doing, like, true experiments to see yeah, if it happened. Yeah. He was, I'm going to make yeah, it, like, I'm going to word this and write this up so that it fits. Exactly. What it needs exactly. to fit. Mm. Exactly. So he was investigated because there was another trial where he straight up didn't complete a test that would prove that this quote unquote blood that was found was actually human blood. Like it could have been something else. But that's like there. that's what kind of started it all. And mm-hmm. then they started like investigating all of his stuff. And he worked on the on Kathleen Peterson case. So in 2011, um, Michael Peterson is granted a new trial for the murder of Kathleen Peterson. And something, so the other thing that's really, to me, I'm just like, oh my freaking gosh. So the the forensic expert, the blood, but blood spatter dude, who was a witness for the prosecution, he's under, under investigation, right? Yeah. They basically said, you made a bunch of your shit up, you lied to the jury, you lied to the judge, like you lying to everyone. And then what the defense does is, in order to prove, you know, he did lie, Michael Peterson needs a new case, they bring in a slew of their own blood spatter experts, including this guy, Tom Bevel. And if you've watched forensic, he's been on probably like a dozen forensic file episodes. He's been on a ton of like crime stuff because this guy, Tom Bevel, is like one of the dudes who does blood spatter stuff. Like he straight up wrote a book that is used to teach, like, blood spatter stuff. And so they call this dude um, during the retrial, and they say, like, is anything that the prosecution's blood spatter guy did correct? And the bevel guy's like, no, it's all a bunch of bullshit, da 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 And it's all bad, it's bad science, that's that's not what you do in the blood spatter field, da 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 But then, and it's funny because I didn't realize this when I first w- was watching it, I, I learned about this later, Basically, and I think, and what's even crazier is I'm pretty sure it was around the same time of the retrial, if not before, the National Academy of Science, they do a review of blood spatter stuff. And they basically said, all blood spatter is bad evidence. So they basically say that it's really subjective. Any kind of blood spatter cast off, like blood pattern, da 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 it's really subjective There's a lot of unknowns when you're trying to analyze it, and it's all BS. So it's just crazy to me that, A, that they relied on it in the first place, and then, B, that they they even brought in experts to say, like, oh, well, his is BS, when the whole thing is BS. So it's just, I don't, it's just, it's one of those crazy things about this trial, but that was kind of like a sidebar. So anyway, he's granted the new trial. And he actually gets out of prison on bond again, gets put on house arrest for a couple of years. Um, and it actually takes six years. I was like, does he do it actually, again? Like, <laughs> like, no, I mean, I right, like, right, like he, he gets out. So this guy gets out and it takes like six years for anything to really happen. So during the six years, they are still going through like different, like, like they're trying to plea out. They're trying to get dismissal of their case. So like. The very first thing they do is they try to just plea out. Yeah. But Kathleen's family is like, no, that's no, that's not okay with yeah. us. You're guilty and you, you, you deserve to stay guilty. You're not going to take a plea. And so, you know, they didn't yeah. do that. So Her sister's like, like, I made yeah. that pick hole. You do not get to use it as a murder weapon. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that was a gift. She's like, not my pick hole, <laughs> motherfucker. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, then in... 2016. So this is like five years after, like he first basically gets yeah. out. They go through a bunch of other stuff um, for the trial, and the defense team basically finds out that the investigation was botched from the beginning, and they're arguing for a dismissal. 
because they find out that the crime scene investigation procedures, they were changed. And probably because of that original blood spatter guy, yeah. he I think he messed with it. They never did straight up DNA testing on Kathleen Peterson's clothes. The sweats that she was wearing, the shirt, they never did mm. DNA testing. And instead, they sent it straight to the blood spatter expert. I feel like that's guy. hard anyways, like in my opinion, just as like a devil's advocate. That's hard anyways because if that's my husband, he's going to be touching my my clothes or yeah, whatever true. anyways. But they would definitely find his and her, probably her, well, hers, obviously, and, and probably his. But what they were trying to say is, what if it wasn't an accidental fall? What if an intruder came in, hit her, and there's a third person's DNA on this stuff, and we'll never know because the D. Thank you. That's what Are you, I is that where you're going? He, yeah. It's so funny that you said <laughs> that right. because at the end of this, I so funny you say that. At the end of this, I was going to ask, what do you think? Because my opinion from the beginning, from the very first time I ever heard this case, saw the case, whatever, I was like, it's him. Yeah. Oh, it's fine. That's crazy. Oh my God, it's so funny. Okay, okay, okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So they never do DNA testing. And then what happens is after, you know, after like the initial stuff, the, it wasn't stored properly. All of the evidence wasn't stored properly. So now they can't really do DNA testing because it would be contaminated. Like it was all mixed in with different stuff, like not sealed and stuff like that. So the, 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 the defense is basically saying you know, they didn't do DNA back then. We can't do DNA now. How are we really supposed to give him a fair trial is what they're saying is that this is like against his constitutional right to a fair trial. Um, So they're asking for a dismissal. But the judge is like, no, there's other things in this trial other than DNA evidence. Like this is not grounds for a dismissal. Finally, in 2017, so this is, so remember she died in 2011. Right. Oh, I thought you said yeah. 2001. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, sorry. 2001, you're oh, correct. Okay. 2001. In 2011 is the, like, the retrial process starts. In 2017, yeah. wow. Peterson and the current DA, so they've gone through, like, a couple DAs at this point since, obviously, since the original. Yeah. They actually reach a deal that he will sign an Alford plea. Hmm. And the family, they're not very happy about it, but I think... Because, like, they found out that they wouldn't be able to use any of the DNA evidence again. And then something with, like, the warrants and stuff, like, because it all was happening with this dude, this original investigator who was, like, making stuff up. Like, they wouldn't be able to use a lot of that evidence in the in the case. Um, they, they end up, like, deciding to plea out. So, basically, what an Alford plea is, is... The person, the defendant, gets to maintain their quote-unquote innocence. They get to say, like, I'm innocent. But they're acknowledging that there's still enough evidence that they would be able to convict them. I don't know how that's legal. Mm -hmm. But basically, they, they plea out and he pleads guilty to a lesser charge of voluntary manslaughter. And where originally he was... It was um, first degree murder. Yeah. Right. So, and and in exchange for basically time already served. I was going to say he'd time been served. In. So then, exactly for eight years he'd been in. So they said you don't need to go back to jail. And the crazy thing is, like, they don't let things die. So during this, um, like, part where they're doing the Alfred plea and he's getting like his sentencing or whatever. So you know, normally in sentencing. That's when, if a family member of the victim wants to speak and say, like, put this guy away for life, like, yeah, like, that's when they let them speak. Um, So during this sentencing, Kathleen's sisters get up and they just, like, one of them especially, like, rips him a new one. She's like, you're guilty, you know it, da-da-da-da, and she goes on and it's, I mean, it's crazy. And also during this, this part of the trial, so this is like, I mean, it's done, it's over with, it's done. But the defense brings up a couple of things that they had found out. One, they said that they find a note from the original medical examiner who had written it was blunt force trauma from from a homicidal whatever. It was homicide. They find a note from her saying that originally she was going to write that Kathleen died from blood loss. 
which could have happened just from her falling down the stairs, but that she was pressured into writing homicide blunt force trauma by her supervisor. What is Does wrong this note with exist? People? I don't know. I could say, I don't know if this note actually exists. I don't know how they find out about it, but whatever. That's what they say they find. They also say that they find out that when the prosecution investigators, when they were looking and searching the house for the pick hole, they actually found it. Shut the fuck they up. took pictures with it. They found it. And they put it back. And the defense says that they did that because the prosecution already had this, the kind of was like building their case around. He did it with the blowpoke and then he hid it. So if they find the blowpoke that was quote unquote hidden and it doesn't have any blood or any other evidence on it, they can't claim it was the murder weapon. Aye, aye, aye. So they, the defense says, and, and they, this is all like word of mouth, how they found out about it, I think. Like, there's no actual evidence or whatever. Mm-hmm. But it's crazy. Like, to, to the point where the guy is already like, I'm going to plead guilty to this. I'll have my time served. Like, sign it and move on. They're still bringing this stuff up. Jeez. And so it's, it's, yeah, it's so crazy. So he, de- he takes this, the deal, but he still, like, to this day proclaims his innocence. But he's out. So they gave him time already served. Um, and he still lives, like, in the same town. He's written, like, books about the whole thing, and yeah. he's out. Um, and it's crazy. And that's not even <laughs> the last thing I want to tell you about. There's more! <laughs> so you, and then, you might remember. And then, yeah, This is literally and then, and then, and what and then, this and case and was and like. You, every time... I hear or read or watch something about this case. I'm like, how is there more? How is there more? So another thing about this case, and this part is just kind of, to me, it's fun. It's ridiculous. It just goes to show how freaking ridiculous this thing was. This is the owl theory. Do you remember this? Yes, I do. I do. Well, because she had the feathers. There were feathers on her. (laughs) I do. I do remember that. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So in between... The trial, like the original trial, and then the retrial. So while Michael Peterson was in jail, was in prison for Kathleen Peterson's murder. Yeah. One of his lawyer friends, who had nothing to do with the case, he holds like this whole press conference, and he gives all this evidence with the idea that a wild owl attacked Kathleen. Yeah. And that's how she got the lacerations on her head, and probably like she ran inside trying to get away from the owl and then she falls and trips and she loses consciousness and she loses blood because he says that microscopic owl feathers were found in her hair and that an owl's like talons are yeah could have caused the lacerations on her head very similar to pick holes absolutely very similar because <laughs> them things owl are, talons owl, are very similar yeah. to pick holes like it's like so so it's crazy so and then one of the, like, a big proponent of this owl theory was this woman named Sophia Brunette, who was actually an editor on the Staircase documentary, like, that they were making during the trial. She's, an, like, a film editor on this series that you couldn't, that's, like, on Netflix. So, Sophia Burnett, she actually, what happens is, the trial's over. He's convicted. The Netflix documentary wraps. She's an editor on it. She sends him a letter while he's in prison, just basically saying, oh, I'm so sorry that that happened to you, and it's unfair, and blah, blah, blah. And then they start, like, a long-distance relationship with each other, writing letters while he's in prison, and she even flies out from Paris. She lives in Paris. She flies out, like, three or four times to see him while he's in prison, Eventually, when he gets out of prison because of the retrial, um, they even made plans for him to move to Paris with her. Um, But eventually that fell through because he said, like, oh, I can't leave my family. I've already been away from them for eight years or whatever. I don't want to leave And my male escort. And my male escort I can't leave as well. So, yeah. Um, So that's, that's like... (laughs) That's That's crazy. I know. So a few things I want to know. One... I feel like this is 
a great example of how if you are a rich-ish, well-off white dude, the amount of stuff that you are afforded. This guy was on trial for murder twice. Twice. And during the majority of his trial, which was a long time, the first one was like four months. The second time, he was out for like six years in between. He was home. He was allowed to be with his with his family at home, yeah. not in jail. Yeah. Because he's a rich white dude. I mean, like, the justice system it's crazy. is unfair. It is. A 100%. So sad. Completely biased system. And that next, the other thing that's, like, really sad about this, and like I said kind of at the beginning, this case gets so this and blood spatter and owls and pick holes and gandals and, like, all this oh my. stuff <laughs> that, like <laughs> that you completely lose, yeah, you completely lose sight of the fact that at the end of the day, like, there's a woman, yes, a wife and a mother yeah. who's gone. Yeah. And so during the course of the investigation, like I said, like, Michael's sons, they stick by him. The adopted daughters, they also stick by him. Even after their birth mother was exhumed and the medical examiner said it was homicide, they still stick by him. But Kathleen's daughter, like I said, um, who so. was at first by his side saying, no, I believe you, she ends up switching sides. And that's, like, very sad because, like I said, like, they were a blended family who at one point were all living under the same house. Like, they were close. Right, with the siblings and, now, and everything. And that divide is Exactly, awful. exactly. And Caitlin actually at one point, Kathleen's biological daughter, actually ends up filing, like, a wrongful death suit against Michael Peterson. And that's, like, the sad thing right there because – whether or not he did it, whether or not Michael Peterson killed Kathleen Peterson, the family was torn apart. They lost the mother. Yeah. And, um, you know, she she was Caitlin's mom. She was the stepmom to four of the other kids. They were a blended family. And so not only did these five kids lose their mother, but now there's also, like, the rift within the family. Oh, yeah. Where they can't even stay all together as one cohesive unit to, like, deal with the loss of their mom. Yeah. And so it's, like, really sad because you, you get all of this stuff and all of this drama. And at the end of the day, like, this family is just broken because of this. And so it's it's super sad. It's super sad. I hate that. I hate yeah. that part of it all. You know, stuff like that is this case is really hard for me because as of right now, you can't look at me and say he did it. You can't look at me and say he didn't do it. Right. There is not enough, and that's the reason that, you know, it wasn't solved when it should have exactly. been. Exactly. Um, but it sucks. It sucks. And I, I do think it's funny because <laughs> your face when I said it's the brother, um, you know, or the son, I mean. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, was there how does that blood? Go check so his quickly, MySpace. Like, yeah. I know. Go check his shit out, I was man. just like, look, like, that's so fishy. Like, why does his son, how does his son so quickly show up? Because, like, I'm pretty sure the 911 call happened, and within 10, 15 minutes, the emergency services was there. So how does the son get there in between that time? Right. And to me, I'm just like, like, it's just fishy. Like, he there's gets something there. going on. He finds the pick hole. He, you know, it's... And it's 2.30 in the morning. It's like 2... Yeah, it's like 2.30 a.m. So how in the world... Yeah. I mean, it's I mean? doable. If someone called me, I'd be out the door and on my way really quick, too. So... Yeah. It's, it's yeah. doable. But that... I mean, it is suspicious. Was he ever looked into... So, so I've watched a couple things on this. Obviously, like I said, I think in my opinion, the staircase is very um, one sided. Yeah, they yeah. they don't really talk about the that theory, but there is like a forensic files from like two thousand five. I was gonna say I'm sure or something. read a deep dive. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and where me. they kind of start pointing to the sun, um, saying that like supposedly he didn't really like Kathleen, that it was suspicious that he was there, and that the night that it happened, he wouldn't talk to the cops. That's what the forensic file says. Now, whether or not that's, like, super accurate, because, like I said, this forensic file also says, like, because of the blood spatter evidence, which we now know is all bullshit. Yeah. Like, you know, like, so you, you don't know for sure. But, like, to me, he seems, and when you watch, so that's the other thing. When I watched the documentary the first time, which is 
like I said, I think skewed. I, even though it was skewed, I still looked at the sun and was like, you're suspect. Like, there's something yeah. that you know. Mm. There's something you're not saying. Right. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. Now you have to wash it and tell me what you think. Go ahead, I'm busy. <laughs> it was really funny because I was like, man, I got to watch that. I got to watch that. And then you were like, yeah. And it's like 10 episodes. I'm like, I ain't watching it shit. It is. It's like 10 episodes. <laughs> I ain't watching yeah, shit. <laughs> and, well, and what gets annoying is like, you can honestly fast forward through, I swear, like half of it. Because half of it is just... Like I said, it's so focused on Michael Peterson that, it, like, I swear half of it is just him sitting there smoking his fucking Gandalf pipe, him sitting there listening to random music, staring out a window, yeah. him, because he's an author, he, like, him, like, writing stuff, like, a lot of it is just, like, I need to look him up. like, just, like, whatever, um, so you can fast forward to it, but... Anytime, like, they're in the courtroom, you should watch because it's, like, that is very good. It's very good. And honestly, it's funny because a lot of times, one thing that I did find really interesting when I was watching this documentary is a lot of times when you watch court TV or you see, like, courtroom, uh, like, video, Mm -hmm. you're like, man, these lawyers, like, it's nothing like you see, like, on TV. Like, it's nothing like you see on Law & Order. Like, these lawyers, they stumble over their words, and they're they're not very good, and they they just kind of blah, 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 but on, like, on TV, you're like, oh, wow, what a smart guy, blah, blah, blah. Um, they, um, this, they had some really good lawyers in this trial. Like, more, I mean, whether he did it or not, the defense lawyer that worked, Michael Peterson's case was good. Yeah. He was very good. And so, you know, it, but, you know, it's just, you should still watch parts of it. Okay. I'm going to get to it. I don't know when, but I'm going to get to it. Damn. One of these things. Well, thank you for that. That's crazy. That's wild. Yeah. I have wanted to know more about it. I was waiting for you to do this one since you did it on the crime documentary (laughs) one. Um, Yeah. And I'm sure some of our listeners are waiting for it as well. Um, yeah. Damn, that is wild. I had forgot about a couple of things. I forgot about <laughs> the the other one, Elizabeth, right? and I forgot about the yeah. freaking owl theory. <laughs> owl. <laughs> them talons, though. So funny. That's crazy. Them talons. Them yeah. talons be scary. Them talons be scary. <laughs> man. So man. yeah, that's the case of Kathleen Peterson and uh, Papa Gandalf. Papa Gandalf and owls and pickles. And pickles. <laughs> I need to ask Weston more about that night. <laughs> yeah. I need to. Now, okay, so you, you have to promise that next time we record, you need to, like, go into the whole thing because now I need to know all about it. Yeah, it. it there's definitely more. There's definitely more. So I, I will bring that <laughs> for those of you guys that Good. want to hear about my crazy house. Ooh, just kidding. Um, <laughs> all right, well, thank you for that, and um, we will talk to you guys next week. Um, next week, next week, or. that we're doing a special a Valentine's Day episode. Yes, whoop, we whoop. are. So make yes, sure that you guys send us any of your Valentine's Day stories because we want to share them on the pod. On the pod, make sure you um you can obviously you guys know where to find us um for Instagram and TikTok. Wine underscore time underscore pod. You can DM us. You can send us your Valentine's stories or any other story, or you can email us. Winetimemoms at gmail.com. Get it, get it. Get it, get it. <laughs> Go push up stuff. Go get it. <laughs> oh my god, I haven't heard that song in like 20 years. That's crazy. 20 years. Go 2001. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, I almost made a bad joke. Oh shit. I'm dark. I'm a dark bitch. I was like, she was listening as she. <laughs> oh god. Is wrong with me. All right. Oh, man. Everything's wrong with me, you guys. I keep putting my glasses here so that my eyes match up. Right. I was going to say, okay. it looks like you're Could you see me glasses. earlier doing it? I was like, Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> All right, you guys. We will talk to you next week. And we freaking love you. We love you. Okay, love you. Bye. I love you. Bye. Peace to the owl. <laughs> Go and press your shoulder to see the owl. owl. Gandalf. <laughs> Gandalf the owl in the pig hole. Ay, ay. <laughs> Officially renaming the case. (laughs) Can't off the owl in the pickle. (laughs) Papa can't off the owl in the pickle coming next week. (laughs) New, New case, new case.